Welcome to the IT Project Spring Showcase, everybody. If you haven't already, please make sure to sign in using the QR code on the screen or the link in the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll just get started. Before we do hop right in, I would like to do a little bit of a land acknowledgement and read this out for you guys. So the UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university was built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge their tremendous con contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. Alrighty, just our general itinerary today. Right now, we are doing some opening remarks, let you know a little bit more about our program and our teams. Then we'll head into team presentations around 1020, and then awards and closing statements, followed by a poster session. So a little bit about IG and IG projects. IG stands for the American Institute of Chemical Engineers at UC San Diego. It is first chartered in 1982 and was built to create a community among chemical engineers and offer opportunities for professional development. IG Projects, on the other hand, is a subgroup of IG and was created in 2015 to promote hands-on collaborative learning um, for our um, members. It aims to solve current and pressing environmental issues, which you will hear about in a little bit. So a little bit about us and IG Project leadership. This past year, we had Eleanor Quirk as our projects program director, Nicholas Dorn as our projects program manager, and Jared Ian Gadia as our projects research coordinator. There in the, in the Zoom, big round of applause for them for all of the hard work that they've done to bring us different events and um, also lots of different workshops as well. This upcoming year, just as a formal introduction, hello everyone, my name is Diana. I will be the program director. We also have Hrde and Harleen as our program managers and Joy as our research coordinator. Our new assistants are Serena Lowe, Melanie Oda, Rohan Fonseca, and Lisa Pham. So some of our six teams are fuel cell, cryo desalination, phosphorus wastewater treatment, portable wind power, active water treatment, and ethanol production optimization. They, these six teams range in doing things such as white wastewater treatment to also producing renewable energy. And you'll hear a lot more about them and learn more about their teams in our upcoming presentations as well as the poster session. So. Um, let's give it up to our very first team, Fuel Cell. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> awesome. Cool. Uh, well, um, we are the Aichi Projects uh, Fuel Cell team, and today we'll be uh, presenting on our project, which focuses on engineering a metal hydride-based uh, energy storage system. Uh, and I am the, uh, some quick uh, Sorry. technical difficulties here. No worries, no worries. Um, but yeah, so uh, myself and Joyce Shen are the project leads and uh, we're joined by our colleagues, Jerry Yang, Howard Lowe, Hannah Kim, and Uswa Sarwar. Yeah, we're really excited to sort of, you know, talk about our work today and some of the um, stuff we've been doing uh, throughout the quarantine. All right, to give a little bit of background, so in the age that is hugely dependent on electric power, over 2.8 billion primary batteries are thrown away annually as they're depleted. And less than 5% of them are recycled. This contributes to the escalating waste issue. This, in addition to the safety concerns of the recycled or rechargeable lithium ion batteries, uh, remains challenging hurdles for the industry as a whole. Hydrogen fuel cells, on the other hand, provides a greener storage option with very little waste possible. 
So uh, our team decided to design a self-sustainable solar slash hydrogen fuel cell system that can be integrated onto uh, to the grid structure on campus as a charging station for devices. Next slide. So the system has two main components, the electrolytic cell and the fuel cell. The electrolytic cell itself uses external electric energy to split water molecules into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas in a reaction called water electrolysis. The fuel cell, on the other hand, mm, next slide, please. Uh, the fuel cell, on the other hand, is founded on the reverse reaction of the previous page. With the help of a platinum catalyst, it utilizes those hydrogen fuel and the oxygen gas in the environment to remake those water molecules, and therefore this will produce electricity. Since hydrogen is needed as a fuel for the fuel cell, we needed a way to store and release hydrogen on demand. Traditionally, hydrogen is stored either as a compressed gas or a cool liquid, which is limited by its low volumetric density and it poses safety concerns. A relatively new technology is to store hydrogen chemically by having it react with a metal alloy to form a compound known as metal hydride, which research shown has significantly higher storage density than the previous techniques as shown on the graph on the right. Since hydrogen adsorption is exothermic, heat is released in the process of forming the metal hydride. If we want to reverse that to release the hydrogen, all we need to do is to heat up the metal hydride. A sample metal alloy that we use to form our metal hydride is lanthanum pentanickel, which is the powder shown in the middle. So <clears throat> our hypothesis is that utilizing two standard renewable energy sources namely solar and hydrogen, in conjunction with a novel hydrogen storage system will generate a safe, clean, and scalable energy production and storage process. Here's a summary of our energy production and storage process. First, solar energy is collected in the form of electricity through solar panels. We then take this electricity to run an electrolytic cell which will split water into hydrogen and oxygen gas. We then take this hydrogen gas to store it in a metal hydride storage container. Um, this metal hydride storage container will be temperature regulated and that when it is heated, we will be able to release that hydrogen gas. This released hydrogen gas is then sent to our fuel cell where it would be converted back into electricity and water. This electricity can then be used to power various devices. Um, the water byproduct will then be recycled back to our electrolytic cell for further hydrogen gas production. So in our quest to develop this process, uh, we really value team organization and effectively accomplishing uh, each step of the research process. Uh, to that end, we have three sub teams which execute research and development in the areas of process design, metal hydride storage, uh, and electrolytic cell and fuel cell design. <clears throat> and so uh, each team and the team as a whole follows a um, specific cycle uh, and usually generate a similar pace. So in the fall, we began with a literature search where we sort of read about uh, different methods of um, utilizing metal hydrides uh, and releasing hydrogen from them. Um, additionally, looking into some of the safety considerations of designing this process. Um, and then we began uh, designing the process flow and uh, we began using CAD to design some of the individual components of the process. Uh, so those kind of happen in a more simultaneous manner. Um, and then we look forward in the fall to uh, beginning physical experimentation with and linking the various components together. Uh, after that, we uh, will uh, be assessing revisions um, and then restarting the cycle in order to improve uh, on our um, sort of um, prototype process that we are able to uh, develop. And so right now uh, we are currently in the uh, CAD and process flow phase. So you'll be um, hearing a lot about that in the next few slides. Uh, here's a simple process flow diagram for our um, overall process. Um, so here you can see there's water and sunlight stream going into our electroly electrolysis cell um, where hydrogen and oxygen gases split. And then we can take this hydrogen to store it in the storage and then set sending it to fuel cell. Um, and there's also a water recycle stream. This um, process overview will get, allows us to uh, get a clearer image of our overall process. Um, and in addition to that, we're also hoping to run this in the process simulation when we have the chance to. 
So um, this is sort of the original electrolytic cell prototype. Uh, this was built during the 2019-2020 school year and linking it together with other components was halted due to the uh, obvious you know, COVID pandemic. Um, and so uh, this uh, was a functional prototype and it did indeed uh, split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, right there, those two screws in the middle there um, were sort of the anode and cathode connected to some steel wool, uh, which was able to um, uh, utilize the proton exchange membrane to uh, generate the hydrogen and oxygen. Um, and it was functional, however, it had various issues with the build, uh, and we believe that this design could be improved and streamlined as a single reservoir. So we'll be looking forward to, um, you know, we've generated some newer designs, uh, and as well as designs for other components of the system. So this is the first design that me and Nick worked on for the electrolytic cell. So the rectangular shape we thought would be better for modular purposes. And the cap has two features. One's the two, hole, uh, two holes on each side. Those are to fix the steel wool electrodes. And, the bar, uh, and then the uh, bar flow orifices in the middle to connect to external tubing for hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. And the inside is separated into two chambers by a separator, which will fix the naphium membrane to prevent uh, electron movement across the membrane that's allowing electrolysis to, uh, electrolysis to occur. And so this was sort of our second design, which was a uh, cylindrically uh, shaped electrolytic cell. Um, and as you can see, it sort of uh, follows the same principles. So in the middle there um, is the naphion membrane insert, and that naphion membrane is the proton exchange uh, membrane. And so um, as you can see inside the cell, uh, those two coils represent uh, the steel wool uh, to which the uh, electric current is run, um, which generates the current differential across the membrane, uh, which um, leads to the splitting of the water. Um, and as you can see on the top, we have the uh, two uh, barbed flow orifices. So that, that's where uh, that clear tubing would go. Um, and then sort of right next to those is sort of um, uh, our best uh, sort of design of, you know, representing uh, the wires that would be uh, hooked up to the uh, anode and cathode uh, steel wool. So because the production of hydrogen in the electrolytic cell is powered by solar energy, we needed to store the hydrogen fuel produced so we can power the fuel cell even at times when solar energy is not available, for example, at night or uh, during foggy days. The goal of our metal hydride storage system is to be able to store two grams, which is roughly one mole of hydrogen within a 20 centimeter cubic area. Hydrogen will enter the tank through the orifice on the right and react with the lanthanum pentanical filling the bottom half of the tank before metal hydride. Some hydrogen will also be stored in, in the tank as gas form, which is why we adopted a cylindrical body like most of the gas tanks. The coils you see on the diagram on the right is the threading on the inner surface of the tank, which allows us to embed heating coils into the tank body to heat up the metal hydride when we need it to release the hydrogen. The design also includes a removable cover plate on the right to allow us access into the inside of the tank and perform troubleshooting. Next. Uh, sorry. Um, for the future, since I think we've got the notification to return in person, we hope to start purchasing parts um, with the spreadsheet that we created to, um, to see what parts we need and with the funding. And we hope to start building and 3D print out the current CAD designs that we just previously saw. And once we run tests and experiments in lab and see where we need to fix, we'll create updated prototypes. And hopefully after that, we can connect everything together and finally have a final product to work. And just as a conclusion, with our fuel cell, we hope to create a renewable energy source on campus for students to use daily. We strive to create an efficient alternative to lithium batteries in order to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as a team from local landfills in the area. Next slide, please. And then just a few acknowledgements. Uh, first of all, thank you to our graduating seniors, Joyce and Jerry. And then also thank you to Project's leadership, IT as a whole, TESC, and then Jacob School of Engineering. So with that, we thank you for your time. And I believe we will take a couple of minutes to answer questions.
Thank you. To, okay. Oops. Feel free. Feel free. Um, you mentioned that you were doing some safety analysis, and I was wondering what sort of safety concerns came up in your, in your design. Yeah, so um, essentially, uh, right, the main thing is um, obviously uh, you do have hydrogen gas that's running through your system, and hydrogen and energy, uh, obviously, yeah, that creates an obvious uh, sort of situation. Um, and then the other uh, the other one was sort of looking at how would the different methods or different uh, metal hydrides or methods of hydrogen storage, um, you know, the temperature and pressure associated with those, um, how, you know, how safe would those be, how unsafe would those be. Um, and so, you know, sort of looking at, you know, what temperature is required to release the metal hydride, um, what pressure is required to store the, sorry, release the hydrogen from the metal hydride, what pressure is required to store the hydrogen the metal hydride. Um, and then also uh, just assessing different areas. Um, so in our process flow diagram, obviously we have various valves. So sort of assessing, um, you know, where we would want, uh, you know, valves that could potentially stop any flows uh, um, in the event of a, uh, you know, a breakdown or something. Uh, so assessing where those need to go. Um, so that was sort of uh, the main things uh, among a few others. But yeah, that's generally kind of what we were thinking about uh, because obviously we want this process to be, uh, part of it is, you know, being safer than just having a tank of compressed uh, hydrogen. A tank of just compressed hydrogen does seem a bit unsafe, so <laughs> good for considering that. Um, just a follow-up question for that. Um, in what state of matter is the hydrogen stored inside the lanthanum pentanickel hydride? Is it like gaseous or liquid? Yeah, so basically you're exposing the uh, metal hydride to like a gaseous hydrogen, like a, yeah, like a gaseous uh, state of hydrogen. Um, but it sort of complexes, um, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's, you know, it's not quite a gas, it's not quite a solid, but I, I guess I would call it, I mean, kind of like solid state um, because it does complex with the solid uh, lanthanum pentanickel where it sort of um, fits into the different, uh, you know, grooves between the uh, uh, lanthanum pentanickel or lanthanum and nickel um, atoms. Uh, so yeah, exactly. It sort of uh, reacts with the hydride and, um, yeah, so I would say there is hydrogen gas within the tank at a low pressure. However, um, a lot of it sort of, you might say, adsorbs into the metal hydride. So it's kind of a quasi-solid gas state. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to unmute, raise your hand, or even drop them in the chat. I'll wait a couple more seconds to see if anyone has anything. I have a question, actually. So about the design and uh, about the electrostatic cell, what are you guys using to neutralize the, all the anions inside the chamber? Since the chamber is becoming more positive as you react with the chamber. To, I mean, I would say that's probably something, I would say that's probably something we haven't really considered yet, but I mean, basically just going off of our last design um, where uh, it was, I guess, I mean, the solution was, um, it was essentially, yeah, like uh, we were using one more solution of um, potassium hydroxide. Um, so I guess you provide uh, a fair amount of like hydroxide cations in the, or sorry, anions in the, in the solution there. Um, uh, and that seemed to work pretty well um, as we, you know, uh, ran electricity or ran current through the system and um, we're generating the hydrogen oxygen uh, for long periods of time. It did not seem that there was any major um, issues with that. Um, but yeah, I guess, uh, you know, there's a couple of different options though, just thinking about off the top of my head, which is like, um, I'm sure the, um, yeah, there's the hydroxide anions in the solution. And then there's also, uh, you could attach like, just 
um, any certain sort of, um, uh, yeah, like metal um, that could essentially absorb the um, excess positive charge and uh, potentially, you know, corrode. You could put some sort of corrosive metal that would uh, corrode based on that and absorb that charge. So, but yeah, that's definitely something that uh, we're looking into currently. Thank you. All righty, a last call for any questions for fuel cell. Okay, well, thank you to your team for presenting. It sounds like such a great idea and I hope to be able to see your prototype in the future. Um, we shall be moving on to our next presentation from cryo desalination. All right, hi everyone. So we're team cryodesalination or CDS for short. Our goal is to essentially create potable water from um, seawater through a freezing process that allows uh, the fresh water to freeze separately from the seawater. So this would remove the salt from the seawater and it would lower the salt PPM um, in ocean water, which would make it drinkable. So the main future goal for our team is to make this freezing desalination process happen as fast as possible, and then it can be directly applied to three different areas. Uh, the first would be for human consumption, so people can drink this water, and then also similarly for agricultural purposes. Um, I mean, considering we live in California, our economy is largely uh, driven by um, creating produce, so having that efficient water supply with our process would be very ideal. And then secondly, um, for oil and gas exploration purposes, uh, the oil and gas industry uses a lot of uh, water uh, through their processes and that water ends up having very high salt contents. And so being able to treat that water uh, would be much more efficient with our process versus um, having to transport it to a treatment center that is usually very far away from the oil fields. And then the last one uh, would be for coastal communities uh, to be able to utilize their geographical location and um, use the water that's right next to them. Um, so for a little bit of background, um, so the earth may contain many cubic miles of water, um, 326 million cubic miles to be exact, but actually only under 3% of it is actually potable and even a smaller percent less than 1% is accessible while the rest is trapped in glaciers or underneath the earth. And as Earth's population just continues to grow and grow, a handful of people are already lacking access to a clean and reliable source of drinking water. And one technique of desalination is reverse osmosis, which removes particles with a pre-filter. Now, despite this process being an energy efficient process, cryodesalination itself has a higher potential of energy efficiency. And so our crowd desalination team is deviating from this reverse osmosis technique. And we're actually looking to remove salt from a solution by cooling the solution. And right now our main goal as a team is to create more usable fresh water through a cost and energy efficient method. And we're gonna do this by engineering a small scale system for the distillation of salt water. So this is our prototype um, that we currently have. And uh, the main idea that we go off of is the fact that fresh water's temperature is slightly higher than salt water. And so when we're doing our experiments, we try to get it to the temperature uh, of the fresh water. So what's left behind is the salt contents. And then our coolant is um, our main factor that controls our temperature of the solution so that it comes to the ideal temperature and it's made up of isopropyl alcohol and uh, dry ice. And then our styrofoam container is an insulator and uh, it prevents heat loss or gain from the solution to the surroundings. And uh, so far we have uh, successfully reduced the salt concentration from 10,000 ppm to 3,400, uh, which is very good. 
but um, drinkable water is around 600 ppm, so we kind of have a ways to go. And uh, overall, we have uh, discovered um, that carrying out our experiments over a longer time period uh, produces much more efficient results. And stirring our solution uh, with the stirring rod um, is also helping with the freezing process to occur as we want it to. Uh, so as far as next steps go, <clears throat> we've split up into two teams, an automation team and a design team. As far as automation goes, we have two primary goals. Uh, the first is to implement an automated stirring mechanism. Uh, and in that regard, we've already coded in a simulated Arduino environment uh, to control motor speed using a potentiometer. Uh, so we're currently researching the appropriate waterproof motors and the next step is essentially just to implement this. Uh, but we already have the code, we already have the um, schematic. Uh, for the temperature sensor, which is the other thing that we're working on automating, uh, we've also written Arduino code for this, but we have not yet uh, simulated this environment. Uh, and furthermore, we have actually found a waterproof temperature sensor, but we haven't implemented it yet either or purchased it. Um, a lot of this we plan to do when we return to in-person testing, uh, but as of right now, the most we can do is simulate these processes. Um. Um, so on the other side, on the design team side, uh, to improve the design of our prototype, we, we thought that um, improving the stirring mechanism would uh, increase the freezing time. So we um, had designed this new stirring mechanism on the side. Um, so the plan is for this to be 3D printed. Um, the new stirrer will be a spiral shaped rotating cylinder with uh, conical shaped holes on the surface to trap the ice, um, but to not, to let water flow through, but still trap the ice. So that's the, the, the gray areas you see on the image. Um, and then, this stirrer will also be collecting the ice um, as it stirs and bringing it up because we had the problem of it um, sticking to the sides previously. So we're hoping that that will curb that. Um, with this new design aspect, we are also going to be implementing um, a server motor controlled by Arduino, as Alex talked about in uh, the automation slide. So it will automate this process and it will take um, one less step off of our hands. Um, so the reason why we chose cryo desalination over other desalination designs, such as uh, reverse osmosis and distillation, is due to their better operating costs and or uh, better energy efficiency. So uh, the materials for our system are easily attainable and they're less prone to abrasion by the stirring of seawater. On the other hand, with the reverse osmosis and the membranes they utilize, they can decay very quickly with water constantly being passed through it which can result in having to replace a membrane from time to time. And as you can see, the cost to replace industrial grade RO membranes can be around $12,000 to $8,000. And because a lot of water is being used, uh, reverse osmosis tends to waste a lot of water compared to the amount of drinkable water that, that is produced. Furthermore, distillation is a thermal process that requires a lot of heat to evaporate water compared to the latent heat of freezing. And on average, an input of 2.9 kilowatts is needed for every one gallon of water produced. Also, distillation is a slow process due to the low pressure of uh, rising steam. Cryodesalination, however, is not only cost-effective, uh, but energy efficient. Uh, the materials used are very affordable, uh, coolant composed of dry ice and isopropyl alcohol, and a styrofoam container works as the insulator, uh, which prevents heat transfer from occurring. For our heat exchanger, uh, an aluminum can is utilized due to its efficacy in maintaining a, a desirable temperature. And lastly, we would like to thank um, Tusk and IG Projects and Leadership uh, for supporting us and funding our team. Thank you. We'll take any questions. Once again, if you do have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask, or you can drop it in the chat and I'll ask it for you.
Um, one question I have for you guys is, um, how do you see this design being implemented in the future? Will it be something that's handheld or a larger scale process? Um, well, we have been thinking about scaling it up um, so that it can be used for larger purposes. Um, but uh, so far, it's probably going to be a larger size, but we're also trying to consider it, the prototype to be portable so that it can be taken different places and be ideal in that sense. So yeah, we, we hope to apply it on a larger scale. Last call for any other questions? Oh, there's a question in chat. Could this process be used to remove other undesirable chemicals from water too? Um, so far, we have only looked at um, removing salt um, just due to the fact that we're um, basing it off of seawater. Um, but that could be something we could look into um, like other chemicals in water versus phosphorus water treatment coming up soon. Okay, are there any last questions? All right, thank you to CDS for the awesome presentation. I can't wait to see what you guys do in the future. Um, coming up, speaking of phosphorus wastewater treatment is PWT. Okay, is this visible to everyone? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. We are the Phosphorus Wastewater Treatment Team, and we are very excited to present to you today at the Archie Project Spring Showcase 2021. So, hi guys, putting on a different hat right now. Um, my name is Diana, and I am one of the co PMs for PWT. Joy on the right of me on the screen is my other co-PM. Um, some other team members are Eleanor, Laura, Steven, Jake, and Josh, who you will be hearing from shortly. We would also like to thank our seniors, Nicholas and Arturo, who will be heading into the industry as well as um, being a PhD candidate at Georgia Tech, respectively. I will um, first off, thank them for all the hard work they've done for our team. We couldn't be here without them. And hand it off to Nick to tell you a little bit more about our project. Okay, everyone. So our team, Phosphorus Wastewater Treatment, is focusing on the problem of e eutrophication. So eutrophication is a, very, uh, is a mostly man-made uh, problem that occurs in our aquatic environments. And it's a, it's a problem when we dump uh, excess amount of nutrients into aquatic environments like nitrogen or phosphorus and any derivative of their ions. So when these uh, nutrients get into the water, algae tend to bloom at uh, excess amounts. And so thus, when there's a, a great deal of algae in the covering the water, they will block out the sunlight. That's supposed to, and then when the sunlight's blocked, uh, normal plants on the bottom of the ocean sea floor are unable to receive this sunlight and they begin to die out. And when they die out, bacteria take up their uh, dead plant matter and use it up for their own purposes. But when bacteria use, are metabolizing, they require oxygen. And so thus, when the oxygen is used up by this uh, excessive amount of dead plant matter and the bacteria use it up, the oxygen levels in the water drop to dangerous levels and aquatic life begin to die out. And so that's a problem that we do not wish to occur. Uh, next slide. So eutrophic zones are occurring mostly in the uh, first world or in develop, developed nations. You can see here on this map, the orange dots represent eutrophic zones. And there's, in our America, we got the west and east coast of the great deal amount of eutrophic zones, as well as Europe and Asia. And eutrophic zones, eutrophication doesn't just occur when we dump a great deal of nutrients into the water. Uh, it's happening year round. It happens up to 80% of the year. 
And so that's, that's where we were hoping to address this issue locally for San Diego. Uh, next. So as Nick alluded to, our goal is to reduce local eutrophia in San Diego area. Um, we're going to do this by focusing on recovering phosphorus specifically from wastewater. And we're going to use that. We're going to do that by using ion exchange columns. So a resin is basically a hydrocarbon matrix, which houses particular molecules, which can be attracted to, um, which can attract um, ions such as phosphate groups. And so um, the benefits of ion um, exchange resins is that they can be regenerated, meaning that the phosphate groups can be taken out again. And so resins can be put into reuse. And um, I think there's a diagram that illustrates the process, yeah. And so when we flow the wastewater through the resins, you can see the negative ions get attached to, um, sorry, the positive ions get attached to the negative beads. And so um, it's an electrostatic reaction. And if we want to use regenerant to flow out the thing again, it's also doable. And the resins we're using right now is called weak weak base anion resin, which um, has a high, higher affinity for phosphate groups. So in this past year, due to, the, due to the pandemic, we couldn't have everyone doing our experiments, and so we split into three sub-teams. First one did experiments, the second one did data analysis, the third one did prototyping. And we're going to hear a little bit from all of the teams now. So the experimental team really has three goals. The first is uh, maximizing the saturation of the resins or really seeing the upper limit uh, to where we can push uh, the materials that we're using in order to pull phosphorus out of the water. In order to test this, we simply put some resins in a column, ran a solution of phosphoric acid and water through it, and um, over time, uh, see how the concentration changed. Uh, after that, we would take we take a saturated uh, resin that's got a lot of phosphorus in it and regenerate it. Basically what that is, is we have the resins that we've already used, and then we put them in a solution designed to uh, remove the phosphorus uh, so we can reuse materials instead of, you know, dumping out uh, the resins every three months or so, which would be a little bit counterproductive. Um, and then the third uh, step, which is what we're on right now, is testing the efficiency of the resins after they're regenerated. So um, seeing if there's any quality loss or lifespan loss after the beads have been uh, regenerated. And so our results have been pretty good. Um, we have recently uh, had our first and second successful removal of phosphorus uh, from the actual resin itself. Um, you can see a picture of that there. We uh, would precipitate out our uh, precipitate out the phosphorus in order to see, know exactly how much we got. Unfortunately, due to our scales and equipment, we are not able to um, measure it to math out exactly how much we have, but uh, to have the amount on screen uh, with how much resin we are using is very encouraging. For the flow system, we already have a, a, a best flow rate, which you can see on screen. Um, and when we're doing these uh, experiments, we measure concentration of phosphorus in the water uh, with, with a pH meter. And um, sorry if this gives anyone flashbacks to gen chem, but the concentration is just tends to you know, negative pH, uh, some quick maths, and we have how much phosphorus is in the water. So when it comes to data analysis, these are some of the examples of models that we're trying to replicate with our own experiments. The graphs that you see here, um, they were published by some other researchers that were working on similar projects, but they're good examples of what we're trying to do here. So we want to use the data that we collect to plot the concentration of effluent phosphorus as time goes by. And this helps us know how well our resins are filtering out the phosphorus in the water solution that we have. And in the next example, uh, we can see that we can also plot concentration data to see when the resins reach phosphorus saturation. So we are currently still trying to gather this data, but this is the kind of analysis that we are trying to put in place. 
Um, so here we have a mock-up of the experimental setup with the burette acting as the ion exchange column. We have the filter and we have the collection flask. Um, this is just to give you a better sense of once again how our setup looks like and this is done via SolidWorks. Um, and next, um, we will be trying to implement a continuous flow process for our ion exchange column using a single column. Um, and essentially, we want to have a regenerative storage container um, that has a regenerant and be able to pump it into the column um, for the regeneration process of the resin beads. So we can reuse them and have one continuous uh, experiment. So as a growing project, we're always looking for ways to improve our methods and research. And one of the ways we went about this this quarter was by seeking knowledge from field experts. So this quarter, we began to reach out to other people with experience in either eutrophication or ion transfer, and we hope to collect new information that can help us improve our system. Next slide. Um, so far, we've been able to connect with a few sources, um, notably Dr. Cla Dr. Clarissa Anderson, Dr. Brent Hughes, and also the SD Coast Keeper. And they provided us with some valuable feedback, such as advice on scaling up our iron transfer process as well as some information on the role of phosphorus in various aquatic environments. And also from these contexts, we were also pointed in various new directions and we were also given um, additional names to look into. So in the future, we plan to uh, continue reaching out for advice and we also hope to build our connections as we go along in the process. So in terms of our plans for next year, um, if you keep clicking on the video, um, we can largely divide the plants into two different categories. Um, one on the theoretical side of things. Um, so for those interested in physical chemistry or molecular mechanics, um, we're hoping to implement say, classical molecular simulations to really see how um, the resin interacts with the phosphate on a molecular level. And also learn more about transfer phenomena models in order to help say design um, different flow systems. So what we have in the bottom left is just a sample um, molecular simulation. This is just water, but we hope to implement it with um, the functional groups on the resin and the phosphate in solution. Now, for those that are more interested in the experimental side of things, um, we're hoping to design and build a flow system with wastewater and ultimately optimize resin absorption and regeneration using fun diagrams like these. Next slide. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Um, we wanted to thank IG, um, IG Project Leadership, TESC, UCSD, and JSOE. And with that, um, we all would be happy to take any questions that you have. I have a question. I probably missed this, but what level resin are you guys using when you're doing the, the flow through stuff? So well, the question, um, which kind of resin? I believe uh, we're using um, oblique seed. Hmm? Yes. Um, I believe it was a, a weak base anion. Joy, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's right. Yes, yeah, so it should be... Um, yeah, many slides back. Um, <laughs> so it should, the, the beads are slightly negatively charged, which attracts um, the positive leaf. Actually, is it weak base anion or is it weak base cation? Um, I think this is an acid resin. So um, this is only a demonstration diagram. So in, in, in the mm -hmm. real situations, the uh, polarity should be reversed, uh, meaning that the mm -hmm. resin should be uh, positively charged. Yes. Thank you. Of course. Do you have other questions? We are happy to answer them. We know far too much about all of the stuff to not answer any questions. <laughs> There is a question in the chat. What are your plans for the collected phosphorus? Ideally, we'll be using them to um, enhance agricultural things in community gardens on campus. So we know there's um, the Warren Garden and the Ravel Garden and all those little gardens are on campus. We're hoping to uh, use the collected phosphorus as a fertilizer for them. Um, right now, we're not doing anything with the collected phosphorus because it is uh, we don't have those connections set up yet, and we don't have a good way to make sure that it's um, safe enough for the plants. 
um, but ideally in the future we'll be partnering with the community gardens. Yeah, if you know a community garden, let us know. <laughs> I want to get in contact with you. I had a question. Um, are there any benefits to having phosphorus in water or is it just really bad to have in water? That is a great question that we've been talking about with our um, contacts actually. So phosphorus is a, an essential nutrient for most plant life. Um, so like if you can see on this healthy ecosystem side of this diagram, uh, the plants at the bottom of this uh, lake or estuary or whatever this is, they do need some amount of phosphorus in order just to survive and thrive. Um, the problem is really when you get um, an excess amount of phosphorus and it doesn't take a whole lot for it to be an excess, um, but it, it, it is there. Um, it's pretty, pretty easy to get an excess amount um, of phosphorus in water. And also fun fact, it's, I think we determined that there's about eight parts per million um, of phosphorus in like normal drinking water. So it's, it's everywhere. Um, a, a little amount is, is just fine. Alrighty, last call for any questions to PWT. Remember, you can also um, put your questions in the chat as well. Okay, well, thank you to PWT for the presentation. Um, we will be heading on to our next team, which is portable wind power. Hello everyone, we're Portable and Power and I'm Chase. Hello, I'm Michelle. I'm a third year chemical engineering major. Hey, I'm Brian. I'm also a third year chemical engineering major. Uh, and my name is Henry and I'm also a third year chemical engineering major. And today we're presenting Portable Wind Power. So as a bunch of chemical engineers, um, we decided to, for some reason, take on a mechanical task and build a portable wind turbine. So uh, definitely out of our territory, but I think as the more we've done it, the more we've kind of loved what we've been doing. So yeah. So the question to ask why wind power, um, we personally believe that wind power is a perfect opportunity to kind of harness this energy that can then be utilized by students on campus. Um, because of our close proximity to the ocean, in addition to, you know, the current wind turbine on campus being kind of in a low traffic area, we thought a portable wind turbine was kind of uh, a great way to have that potential to become a great re resource for UCSD undergrads. So our plan is to construct a portable turbine that's approximately five feet tall, uh, which can then be placed anywhere on campus where it can generate you know, electricity from wind rotating its blades. Um, when approaching our design, we went for a universal base that would allow for simple interchangeability uh, between horizontal, horizontal and vertical blade arrangements, which has actually been split up into two separate subgroups. Um, so reasons to go with uh, a particular setup, whether it's horizontal or vertical can you know, kind of depend on uh, a bunch of different factors from altitude to wind speeds, uh, inconsistencies with the wind and, uh, and more. So like Henry said, we have two different designs. Uh, as you can see, the unified uh, vertical design here on our left side and then the blade for the horizontal design, we kind of have the horizontal designs put up over the next couple of slides. You'll see a bunch of different pieces of it. Um, 
to create these though, we've been using Fusion 360. It's like Google Docs, but for like an AutoCAD. Um, so it allows us to collaborate and kind of work on one another's projects. L literally, it's Google Docs for AutoCAD. Um, uh, different blades for different turbines. Like the requirements for a um, vertical turbine is are different than the requirements for a horizontal turbine. And as such, we have different designs. And I know as chemical engineers, we don't really have a lot of um, experience in AutoCAD. And I, you know, when I joined the team, uh, I had none. I learned entirely how to do this over the past year. And it's something that's not that intimidating. So if you're looking to join our team, it's, you, we will gladly teach you how to do this. So, like I said, this, these are the uh, the hubcaps for our course. And there's kind of two overriding goals here. One is efficiency and the other one's safety. So when it comes to efficiency, as you can see on the kind of bottom and bottom right designs, those um, are kind of all curved in such a way to keep down the drag and to keep our turbine up, right? Um, when it comes to safety though, we have um, kind of a little more nuanced approach. When we uh, secure our blades into the um, hubcap, we have them secured in a way that they don't kind of like shake out. And furthermore to the shaking out point, um, we, we want to counter thread our screws on our bolt so to the counter to the rotation of the blades so that when the blade rotates, we have um, basically the bolts tightening more. The next slide. And so, yeah, on our right side here, this is was our old design. Last time you saw us, we were kind of coming, going along with an idea of using a gear design, kind of just having gears rotate. Um, we've moved away from that for just the sake of efficiency and towards more of a uh, direct shaft into a generator. But the skills we learned here is how to, you know, pretty manufacture um, the teeth on a gear. We're using that more of our universal base and our kind of housing for our uh, turbine. And so it's kind of a, you know, try one direction and we found another way to do it. But with the skills that we learned in that first direction, we're applying to our sort of thing. Um, and we've also kind of moved into the 21st century with uh, AutoCAD replacing a kind of hand-drawn schematic. All right, so we chose to do uh, to use Arduino for data collection, the data visualization, and as a control mechanism for the turbine. Uh, we did, designed it in Tinkercad so we'd be able to work on it together. Uh, the goal of working of tinkering with Arduino is to be able to measure the voltage output of our wind turbine. These, this output voltage would be able would be displayed on the LCD screen, as you see right here. Um, we also include these green and red LED lights to indicate whether the voltage surpasses a certain value with the green light meaning that it meets the value and red meaning that it doesn't reach the value we specified. Additionally, the, pot the potentiometer will be used to determine wind direction and tell the serv servo motor where to turn the turbine um, so it can be lined up perpendicular to the wind. Uh, so since we can't meet up in person to work on our design, we've taken the opportunity to learn and develop new skills. Specifically, we've been developing, developing our skills in Arduino, AutoCAD, and laser cutting. Um, we also took advantage of our school's licensing to take LinkedIn learning courses in AutoFusion and Arduino. Um, working in AutoFusion, uh, as Chase said before, uh, has made working online together really simple because it allows us to work on a design simultaneously, similar to how you work together in Google Docs. So despite everything being online, we, we kind of ended our project um, once the pandemic hit. We were going into our building stage, but we have made a lot of progress throughout the year. And some of that is we designed our universal base and we are going to start the Fusion 360 design on that. And we conducted a lot of battery research and we selected the final battery we are gonna to use to store all of the energy we produce. And then one method we've been utilizing virtually is making these living documents. So we're really focusing on all the design aspects. So um, we create this living document for 
the battery, the universal base, and the horizontal and vertical setups, and also the Arduino. So just laying out every possibility and everything we want those designs to do, and then categorizing them into the necessary design elements or maybe elements we want to save for later prototypes. And then we also, like Brian showed us, we completed the Arduino circuit we'll be using. So we'll be able to record all the voltage readouts and also align our turbine in accordance with the wind direction. And so during the COVID pandemic, we took a lot of courses on wind energy in general, and then we did LinkedIn Learning to learn Fusion 360 and done a ton of virtual prototyping with Fusion. And then it is very much in our team nature, team culture to host game nights and socials. So we've been having quite a few virtual team socials to keep us all connected. And so the goals moving forward is we hope to make a fully complete Fusion 360 model of our turbine to get that complete visualization before we start to build. And then we have quite a few generators. Um, so we want to test each generator and gather some data to decide which one we want to end up going with. And then our team is just super excited to start the physical construction of the turbine. So we're looking forward to that in the fall. Yeah, and thank you to our sponsors, TGIF, TESC, and Aichi Projects. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, I have a question. So, so far, have you identified any potential locations where this turbine could be placed around campus or San Diego? And how, how would you go about determining those locations? Yeah, we haven't looked completely into that yet. We kind of just, our main focus is getting our running prototype. Um, but that is in the stage of when we start to test it, we'll test it in different locations around campus. And I know especially our campus is very hilly and there's lots of different environments. And um, so it'll be, it'll be a fun time when we start to test. When, um, when you say portable for your wind power, how portable is it something you could move on like a day-to-day -day basis for, you know, different, you know, weather patterns, or is it something that maybe you might take like a day to set, set up and could stay there for a week? Yeah, it's definitely like portable is in the name. So I would say it's easily um, transportable. Um, I think, yeah, we're also just keeping in mind how much it weighs too, because we don't want to lug around something super heavy. But um, yeah, I would say it's it's fairly portable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the current design focuses on mounting the base on a on a tripod similar to one of a camera, so um, it can be folded up pretty quickly. And we're also working on a design to kind of attach a handle to it, so it can be kind of picked up like a carrying case. Okay, are there well, any this, last questions? <laughs> when this turbine is um, eventually implemented, who will be moving it around? Will it would be the team or will it be someone else? Ideally. Probably the team. Um, of course, if we wanted to implement it fully into campus, we'd have to um, contact people to get permission to do that. Um, but as of right now, it would be us and if the school allows it, we will go with whatever their regulations are. There is a question in the chat. Any ideas to implement the design on a backpack would be nice to generate power while walking. 
That is kind of a cool idea. I like that. Um, we haven't talked about that. Um, of course, I think we'd have to talk about safety too, because we don't want giant propellers or the blades going around and hitting someone. But I, I like I like that. It sounds innovative. Um, yeah, maybe when we want to scale it down even more to make it more portable, that could be an option. Yeah, I think I'd be nervous too. But hey, maybe we could find a solution for it. All righty, are there any last questions? Okay, well, thank you to PWP for the awesome presentation. I can't wait to see some of these pop up around campus when we can, obviously. Um, we shall be moving on to our next team, which is the active water treatment. Um, can everybody see this? <laughs> okay, Yes, great. we can see it. Um, I'll just introduce myself real quick. I'm Haley. I'm one of the PMs for AWT, and Breeze will take over from here. Hi, I'm Breeze. I'm the other co-PM, and our team is Active Water Treatment. Um, so our goal is to alleviate the substandard health and living conditions uh, in the Navajo Nation, um, and we plan to do this by cleaning their water supply of its heavy metal um, and nuclear ion contaminants. Um, this is our team. Uh, so as we mentioned, myself along with Haley are the co-PMs with Tina and Zach being the rising co-PMs. Um, Rebecca is our financial manager and Animo is our CAD master. Hi, I'm Tina. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the background and the problem. So when uranium was discovered in the Navajo territory in the 1940s, the U.S. mining companies began extracting it for over four decades to keep up with the demand for nuclear energy. The improper closure of these mines has allowed uranium to seep into the surrounding landscape, polluting the soil, air, and water. According to the U.S. US EPA, the maximum concentration level of uranium in water should be around 30 parts per billion. In some places, it's around 700. Next slide, please. So the problem is that drinking uranium or consuming it through crops is linked to increased rates of cancer, organ failure, and hereditary birth defects. Additionally, Navajo families only get access to about seven gallons, gallons of water daily, while the average American uses about 80 to 100. Therefore, our team's mission is to alleviate substandard living conditions in the Navajo Nation by removing the radioactive heavy metal contaminants from local sources of water. Specifically, we are targeting the well in Tehachi Spring, shown on the map here, which has a uranium concentration of about 120 parts per billion, which is still four times over the EPA limit. In the past, the EPA has responded to the pollution in the soil and air. However, they have not fully addressed the largest source of harmful health effects, which is the contaminated water. There have been three main past approaches. The first being retention ponds, which are cheap, but take months to achieve the desired concentration and are too susceptible to common environmental conditions like wind or rainfall, which can agitate the pond and cause uranium to contaminate the water again. The second has been traditional ion exchange columns, which are large and stationary, so they would require shipping water across long distances to and from the chemical plant, which is neither time efficient nor feasible in terms of labor. And finally, the third has been reverse osmosis, a common and easily implemented method used for purifying hard water, but requires too much energy to generate the necessary pressure gradient for uranium removal. All right. <clears throat> so um, our primary technology is, in fact, ion exchange. Just a brief overview. Um, this method relies on the charges that are found in metal contaminants. So the process works using a column that's filled with resin beads, um, specifically strong base anion resin in our case, um, which are attached with a negative ion. So in this example, you see here, um, 
it's the blue chloride ions. Um, that's the negatively charged ion. <clears throat> when we run contaminated water over these beads, uh, the uranium will displace the pre-attached resin ion um, and the uranium sticks to the resin beads, therefore removing it. Uh, the uranium displaces the resin ions because the well water that we are targeting specifically at um, the well location that we mentioned um, contains negatively charged uranium in the form of urinal carbonate complexes. Uh, so in the drawings, the negative uranium ions will replace the chloride ions. So ion exchange um, is very beneficial because the resin's affinity for negative ions can in fact be regenerated um, using the strong base after the beads are saturated with the uranium. Um, so we would run, run a strong base through the uranium rich column. Um, and then through Le Chatier's principle, the huge presence of the hydroxide ions uh, causes the uranium to detach from the resin um, and the hydroxide ion to stick to the resin. So the uranium ions are then in the water, <clears throat> which flow out of the column, and that can be collected and then properly disposed of. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so our proposal, um, we want to implement um, this ion exchange by condensing what is often this huge, enormous assembly into something that can fit into the back of a truck or van. Uh, that way the filtering system can be mobile and less expensive and it can go wherever it is needed, <clears throat> specifically in these remote places in the Navajo Nation. Um, our system is also designed to be user-friendly, uh, making it easy to operate um, so you wouldn't have to pay um, a highly trained professional to operate it. Um, there are in fact obstacles when implementing this design um, that we've thought about um, a significant challenge is that many Navajo Nation's water sources are very remote locations, uh, which make traveling difficult. Uh, next slide. So one uh, main thing that we have done um, during this time is really nailing down our uh, virtual model. Um, so our system is designed to get water at or above the legal requirements of potable water while also, um, sorry, of like, yeah, potable water, but we would also like to make it drinkable. Um, so we're planning on doing this by using two activated carbon filters, a UV filter, um, along with the ion exchange column, and we'll address those in later detail, um, in detail later on. Um, this way we can remove the particle contaminants, uranium, and microbes. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm Zach, and I'll be talking about our activated carbon filtration system. So pretreatment is necessary to achieve not only potable but drinkable water. In addition to an ion exchange column, a pre and post filtration will be incorporated into our build. An activated carbon filter uses extremely high surface area of processed charcoal to remove volatile organic compounds, sediment, taste, and odor through chemical absorption. This is highly effective and fairly low cost method to enhance the drinkability of the water that is being treated. Next slide, please. Additionally, for the treated water to be drinkable, we will use UV to remove microbes. Although ion exchange is very effective at treating dissolved ions, it doesn't have effect on microbes. So the implementation of UV sterilization is necessary. How it will work is that we will have a UV filter incorporated into our process stream. The UV lamps will turn on and microbes will be killed in a matter of minutes. So we chose UV sterilization because it has several advantages. Um, it has low energy and relatively cheap, proven to be very effective disinfectant, most recently in fighting COVID-19, minimizes chemical byproducts added to the water compared to chemical disinfectants. Next slide, please. And it is often used in home aquariums, easily maintenance, and all you need to do is replace the bulb. Now we will show how to plan to implement these in our next prototype. So with this idea of our pre-filtration system and a post-filtration system, we hope to implement this to our new design 
um, having the uh, initial tank at the very left over here, um, and then have it go through our pre-filtration system with our activated carbon, and then go through to cycle through our ion exchange column and have that cycle a couple times, and then have our water be treated by the UV lamp, um, and then have this tank to be our final batch. Um, the activated carbon filter also gets rid of odor um, to help with taste, and it also helps with the color of the water, because a lot of times in the desert, the water is kind of like a red brown color, um, so that will definitely help. And then having the UV lamp get rid of bacteria and then having that second tank implemented to our design helps us create like a batch where we can cycle it through after the initial um, filtration in the pre-filter system. So the way that we um, quantify our design is through fluid mechanics. Um, so we basically use a Bernoulli's equation to help calculate um, uh, what kind of pressure we need for to have the best um, ion exchange through our ion exchange column, and then to make sure the system has enough pressure to be able to cycle through with our one pump. So with COVID, um, this year has definitely been difficult because we were in the previous slides, you saw we had a picture of our actual build. So we had to put that on standstill and we decided to do a lot of heavy research to finalize our well location, um, we finalized what type of resin we want to use. Um, we also improved our CAD proficiency. Um, and then we also furthered our contact with the Navajo Nation by getting in contact with environmental scientists from Diné College in Arizona, and also Dr. Rock, who we're really looking forward to talking to him in a couple weeks with a presentation. Um, and then we've also had added new members in the fall, and then we want to further our research and hope to be back in person to continue our build. And so for our future plans, um, we hope to finalize our new system with our CAD model and have everyone have a good understanding of CAD. And then moving into the summer, um, look into computer modeling our fluid mechanics so we have it on a virtual setting. And then continue to keep in contact with our Navajo Nation because we have established a great contact. We don't want to lose that. Um, and then the, in the fall, um, have recruitment and go through the funding competitions and start our conductivity testing, hopefully in the lab. And then moving to winter, start with our quality test, water quality testing, and finally build our prototype. And then in spring, a year from now, doing recruitment and finally test and refine our prototype. So thank you. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, that would be it. If anyone has any questions, once again, feel free to unmute or drop it in the chat and I'll read it for you. Where are some of the challenges that you see um, implementing this on a on the back of a truck or inside of a truck? I'm mean, thinking about uh, pipe difficulties and getting water into and out of it effectively. What do you see as being many problems or other things with that with that design? Yeah, we've definitely discussed this because um, in the Navajo Nation, the well that we're targeting, there is no running water, there is no electricity. So we have discussed um, potential problems with it being on a truck is we need to be able to power the system through the power of the truck. So we've talked about having solar panels. Um, we've talked about having a generator. We've talked about using the battery of the car. Um, so that could be a potential issue. Um, also having the rough terrain, being able to have this van drive into the desert and rocks and all that stuff um, is another potential issue. Um, and then also, yes, condensing our design to make sure it does fit in the dimensions of the truck is definitely something. Um, but currently, right now, it's more of a proof of concept for us to make sure that our system works. And then from there, take our prototype and move it onto the truck and then uh, troubleshoot and how we're going to actually put it on the truck.
because yeah, trucks are expensive, <laughs> but it'd be very cool. <laughs> Um, could you guys elaborate just a little bit on what the maintenance of your filters may be? Because I know um, out there in the desert and especially in contaminated waters, there's also a lot of sediment within the water. So how are you working to combat um, the buildup of sediment in your system? Yeah, so we've definitely talked about um, with the activated carbon filter. Um, we don't have an actual picture of it, but we did... Um, find one we like to buy and it has easy, you can easily pull out the, there's two columns of filters and you can easily pull out the filter and replace it. Um, so if there's a bunch of rocks or dirt or whatever, um, we can easily just take that out and put a new one in. Um, they're relatively cheap filters. Um, so that shouldn't be a huge issue with trying to replace it. We've also talked about adding chlorine. That's a common practice um, for like common homes to have chlorine throughout your pipes to keep the pipes clean. Um, and then also with that said, you might be concerned, well, what is the water has too much chlorine in it later? Well, we do have our UV lights to get rid of everything at the very end. So um, that's something we've definitely thought about. All right, there's also another question in chat. Have you considered the automated cycling of multiple ion exchange columns to limit losses from halting operation for regeneration? Yeah, definitely. Um, I know this project has been going on for, I think, six years, I think, um, or more. And there's definitely been thought of having two ion exchange columns. Um, I think right now with the state we're at, it's kind of expensive for our team to buy two um, before we've even had the chance to build our prototype to prove our concept with one. Um, that's definitely a great idea to implement in the future um, to be able to make it more efficient and be able to um, filter more water at once. Alrighty, any last questions for AWT? Okay, well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I hope to be able to see some of your progress within the next year. We will be moving on to our next and newest team, which is ethanol production optimization. All right, thank you. All right, hello everyone. Our team is ethanol production optimization. We are the newest IG projects uh, team. Uh, we established in December 2020, so that's why, um, in unlike other other teams, we have no specific project or a problem statement going on. But we have been familiarized ourselves with uh, lots of research paper, uh, and we hope to share that with you all today. Okay. And here's our team members. We have Jared and DJ, those are our PMs, and Rebecca and, and Santino, Javier, Dahlia, and Nicholas. They are all with us here today. Next, please. Okay. And unless, uh, in case you guys didn't know, here's how ethanol looks like. <laughs> Next slide. So uh, we're gonna start with what is ethanol. It's a it's a compound made from biomass, uh, and we can see it from crop and crop woods or grass. And it can become even more productive if we use sugar canes and corn. But there's a downside to that, and we're gonna talk about that in the next section. And how and the way we use ethanol as a biofuel is that we're gonna blend it with gasoline to uh, re uh, to reduce the harmful pollution in the gasoline and to uh, fuel the engines, refineries, pumps, and vehicles. And, the, and which is why ethanol serves as an important biofuel because it can supplement or uh, decrease the petroleum usage and help the United States overcome the huge dependence on petroleum and at the same time reduce the greenhouse gases emissions. Also, oh, oh, 
Oh, come back, come back. <laughs> so, so um, uh, we also have a lot of um, renewable feedstock available in contrast to the uh, the limited resources of fossil fuel, and which is um, the reason why our team chose uh, ethanol specifically is that if we capitalize on the power of biotechnology, we can ultimately reduce the cost and increase the high use of success. And also in the conversion process of biomass to ethanol, there's also byproducts uh, with uh, useful fuel properties such as lignin, and that could provide us extra heat and electricity. So in the end, ethanol allows uh, the biofuel a more viable option for uh, the economy. Uh, so digging into a little bit more specifics, uh, the production of ethanol is typically split into two different categories, uh, 1G and 2G standing for first generation and second generation. Uh, first generation ethanol comes from simple sugars or starches. Uh, typically this manifests in everyday life as sugarcane or corn, but there are a couple other more niche feedstocks that are used. But the general process for sugarcane, which is the most simple, is you extract the sugary juice from the sugarcane, you feed that um, those simple sugars to various microorganisms and yeast that go undergo the fermentation process to turn those simple sugars into usable ethanol. Of course, there's distillation and purification to get the ethanol, but that's the general process. The process is very similar for corn, but because uh, corn produces starches as opposed to simple sugars already, excuse me, uh, we have to go with the undergo processes to uh, turn those starches into simple sugars that are yeast and uh, microorganisms can process. This is done through wet or dry milling, which is essentially chemically or physically breaking down these starches so that they can have uh, the access for processing. And then there's the process of sacrification, which turns uh, starches into simple sugars. And from there, the process is essentially the same uh, as the sugarcane process. Okay, so now moving on to second generation, which is our main research focus. Unlike first generation ethanol production, the second generation does not come from our food sources, but rather it's made from lignocellulosic biomass, which is basically uh, plants. And so the um, second generation process undergoes uh, pretreatment, which is the process that serves to prepare the plant cell walls for the hydrolysis step. This step is essential um, to the process because plant cell walls are very crystalline um, structures to them, and it's very difficult to break them apart and extract the cellulose. So once um, they have gotten the pretreatment, now they're ready to be sent to the hydrolysis step. And this step, large portions of complex sugars can be then broken down into simple sugars. Um, and some methods used for hydrolysis have been um, dilute acid and enzymatic hydrolysis. And then once that's done, then it can be fermented using microorganisms. And finally, we can extract and purify ethanol. So that is the basic process. Next slide. So the pros and cons of first-gen ethanol and second-gen ethanol. Although first-gen ethanol is more developed and we know more about it, and it also doesn't require pretreatment, it does cut into our food source and we don't really want that. So second-gen ethanol is a lot more sustainable and although we still need to research more on it, it allows us to use waste as a feedstock, which is very sustainable. And it also uh, has a byproduct called lignin. And uh, as Anne mentioned earlier, it could be used as a fuel source, which is uh, bonus points for uh, sustainability. So overall, second gen ethanol is better, but it's still more expensive. Problems of second gen ethanol, right now it is too expensive and the main reasons why are due to pretreatment and enzymes. So pretreatment is uh, an expensive process because there's a diverse feedstock with second gen ethanol. So it's kind of difficult to uh, overcome that. And with the enzymes, uh, the enzymes are competitive because they are used in uh, different industries. So they are uh, quite expensive. And it's uh, right now, second gen ethanol also is not feasible yet. So energy consumed is greater than the energy to be saved. And it, uh, it is also not widely adopted because it is risky and also costly. And uh, also the recalcitrance of cellulosic biomass uh, causes a hefty pretreatment, which is partly due to, um, which is why pretreatment is so expensive.
So um, unit integration and system optimization is optimizing certain steps in the same process or reactor. Um, here are some different methods that have been researched. Uh, first, we have separate hydrolysis and co-fermentation, is breaking down the carbohydrates, and then having fermentation. So these are separate steps and separate reactors. Uh, this would have less mixing and less energy usage, but a low ethanol yield. Then we have sacrification coupled with co-fermentation. This is the breakdown of the carbohydrates, uh, hydrolysis in the same step as the fermentation. Um, the high ethanol yield, but we have extra mixing in the reactor and high energy. And then finally, we have uh, consolidated bioprocessing. This is where pretreatment, hydrolysis, and fermentation are all accomplished in a single process. So this is all happening in the same reactor. Um, this is efficient, saves time, and reduces cost of cellulose production. However, we don't have an engineered strain that can coordinate well with this process. There is a uh, strain that's being researched, but it's super duper. Cool. Minor technical uh, difficulties. Right. We'll just have to uh, go with it like this. Okay. Um, Javier, the video is not going to play apparently. So that's fine. I mean, okay. So. Pretty much as Nick said, uh, current research has been conducted to combat these difficulties, uh, where most of these improvements are for TG ethanol and how to fix them. And since the G's used for ethanol production are not able to monopolize the specific set of simple sugars and the hydrolysis of plants that will release a lot of them, G's must be gen genetically engineered so they can enter the specific pathways and that allows for the breakdown of such sugars and at the same time produce uh, ethanol more efficiently. And recently, there's a vast amount of research being conducted into uh, microorganism, microorganisms, such as SRVCA and C mobilis. Unfortunately, the video is not working. I had like, a really nice video for you guys. But uh, SRVCA, uh, also known as uh, Braver's uh, G's, has been around for a very long time and it's been commercialized. And it is pretty much important to note that SRVCA is the only microorganism that works for 1G and 2G ethanol. And really fun fact, actually, it's cerveza, which means beer in Spanish. It's derived from Latin name cerveza, which also means beer. So it's a really cool uh, fun fact. And another potential um, G's is C. mobilis, which is smaller in size compared to S. cerevisiae. But this uh, size uh, comparison allows um, C. mobilis to actually have more surface area and also uptake a lot of glucose, which is actually really efficient for ethanol production. The, unfortunately, this uh, GS is not being commercialized yet. And next slide, please. Okay, um, so as Anne said, uh, we are currently in the process of creating our own research product as soon as everything can be transitioned back to in person. So here are some of the parameters like that our product has to be constrained by. So uh, due, to, uh, due to our budget, the, the materials cannot be too expensive and they must be like safe enough to be, be um, ordered by an individual and not necessarily like an official um, uh, medical organization. And the, the project also has to be viable for a school environment. So it has to have like moderate temperatures and pressures. It can't require any expensive equipment that we don't have the ability to buy or uh, take care of. And uh, due to a lack of experience in the biological department, it should not require anything as complicated as uh, cell culture or, or gene editing. And um, uh, most importantly, the project has to create a novel contribution to the field. It should not just be doing something that's, that's already been done and just for the uh, 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 sake of doing the project. And additionally, it, um, as our future lab space is, is most likely going to be in the bio, uh, bio, bio departments, it should be uh, constrained to like, the equipment that the most bio labs have available. And uh, due to time constraints, it should not require constant monitoring, it should be partially hands off. 
Uh, so within those project parameters, we have done a little bit of work in trying to determine uh, some general specific areas that we can go into in terms of an in-person testable project. Uh, right now, we're thinking along the lines of some small-scale proof of concept for generating ethanol. So most of several other of the project teams that presented today, they take a larger idea such as like wind turbines or water treatment that are typically done at large scale and creating something that's uh, portable or uh, small scale that they can test and iterate on in the various pieces that uh, go into it. So that's typically that's what we're thinking in terms of uh, potential area. Uh, we're also thinking of maybe just isolating a specific portion of the production. Uh, as we saw before, there's multiple different steps. We could take one of these individual steps and see how we can optimize that individual one uh, to eventually put into a, a system. We do have some ongoing work, though. Before we do get in person, we are in contact trying to contact other university project teams doing biofuel-based projects. We're trying to contact experts in the field so they can use their expertise to help us narrow our research focus. Uh, we're also trying to work out the logistics of acquiring lab space of faculty advisor and funding for that eventual uh, in-person testing, as well as just generally increase uh, <laughs> generally increasing our expertise uh, on the field of ethanol production. Um, and I think that's it for our uh, presentation. Uh, thank you to IG Project's leadership uh, for supporting us. Uh, thank you to IG as a whole, as an organization. Also, as one of the PMs, I want to thank the people uh, in the team putting a lot of trust in me and DJ because this is a new team. It <laughs> It's a risky thing, and, and it's kind of scary just completely being thrown into this new thing, and I want to appreciate them for putting their trust in us. Uh, and thank you to all the other teams who presented today for providing such like great role models in terms of uh, presentation and like product design. I'm definitely going to reach out to a lot of the other PMs on, on how uh, they structured their, their research. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions about our project? Just a quick question. I know you guys are in the more theoretical phase. Um, should you be able to get your hands on any of these really expensive strains of different things? Which one are you preferring and which one would you reasonably like to start with? Um, I think that we had talked about using E. coli in the past, like just because there are strains of it that are more standardized and commercially available, and they're like known to be uh, a, a safe if you happen to screw anything up. We're not exactly sure exactly how E. coli is going to be like work into the project, but th but that's our main candidate as of now. Yeah, E. coli was of particular interest to us because although the more common strains are the ones that uh, Javier was talking about, like S. cerevisiae. Um, they're well known to be very good at producing ethanol uh, given the simple sugars. Uh, e. coli is significantly more expensive and relatively more accessible, which I think fits nicely within our project parameters of being small scale and testable. Um, but in, if, if, if money was no option, we definitely would go with the more uh, effective uh, microorganisms because ultimately that's you know improving our ethanol yield in the end. Uh, but yeah. Any other questions? What has been one of the biggest challenges that you've faced as a brand new team starting out kind of with nothing? Uh, I could take this one, DJ. <laughs> I don't know if I miss anything. Okay. Uh, but I think, at least for me and DJ, the other team members can, can give their own piece if they'd like. But I think just this narrowing scope, like ethanol production as a whole is an incredibly complicated area with a bunch of different subfields uh, in itself. Uh, as we talked about, there's 1G and 2G, and then there's like optimization of different pieces of each of those. Uh, and then there's like different methods of optimizing each piece of the process. Uh, so it's essentially trying to figure out um, what I noticed today at a lot of the other projects is like they have very concise uh, a, a concise problem statement and a concise way of going about approaching that problem. Our current difficulty is generating that concise problem that we want to approach that fits within our project parameters, uh, as opposed to just ethanol production optimization. We're hoping to eventually figure out, okay, what specifically are we attempting to optimize and how are we going to go about it? Awesome. 
All righty, are there any last questions for ethanol production optimization? Okay, well, thank you guys for your awesome presentation. Um, congratulations on creating a brand new team. I can't wait to see where you guys go in the future. And um, we shall get started with the rest of our event. Um, let me screen share really quickly. Once again, if you guys do have any lingering questions for any of the teams, there will be a poster presentation um, at the end of this event. So you can join their breakout rooms and ask them questions um, personally. So just to make sure, can everybody see my presentation perfectly fine? I see some nodding heads, thank you, thank you. Um, okay, so once again, thank you to all the teams for your awesome presentations. Uh, leadership would like to award you guys for your greatness this year. Um, so our awards that we are presenting are best presentation, best poster, best team organization, best team dynamic, as well as some MVP awards. So um, the first two for best presentation and best poster will actually be decided by you guys, by the audience. Um, if you guys could scan the QR code or check out the link, um, you'll be able to vote on who, do you, who you think has the best presentation or poster. Um, obviously the posters will be sent or will be viewed afterwards in our poster presentation. So don't forget to miss out or don't miss out on that, sorry. Um, just to know if you are currently on a project team, please do not vote for your own team or your, your ballot will be voided just so that it's fair for everybody and you, it's just not a pile of people voting for themselves. So I'll leave this up just for a little while longer. Um, and, and the link is going to be posted in the chat very, very soon, very, very quickly. Ah, there we go. Okay, the link is now in the chat for you guys if you'd like to click on that. Um, and it should just take you to a very simple Google form. So I'll wait maybe like five seconds so everyone can at least open it up. Okay, so moving on to our next award, which is Best Team Organization. This was uh, decided by our um, outgoing leadership using a rubric that we sent to all of the PMs. So can I get a little drum roll virtually? Uh, I don't really know how to do this part, but. <laughs> so um, the, the team with the best organization for this year is, da -da -da -da, Fuel Cell. So obviously congratulations to Fuel Cell on everything that you guys have been doing. We love seeing your team work around everything and, um, yeah, you guys should be receiving a certificate possibly in your Slack or email very, very soon. <laughs> okay, so our next award is for best team dynamic. And this was also based off of a rubric, basically saying um, how well the team got together, um, how well they worked together and all the other things like that. So, Friends, another drum roll, please. Our team with the best dynamic is da, 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 phosphorus wastewater treatment. Congratulations to um, everybody on our teams. And I will get started with the MVP awards. Okay, so the MVP awards were decided by um, individual PMs and each team has their own specific MVP. Once again, um, before we start with these, I just wanna say thank you to every single project's member. Obviously this year has been a little bit difficult given the virtual nature of everything. We would love to be in person, to be meeting all of you, to be having all these build sessions, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys have done so well in adapting to the virtual climate and making sure that your teams are still progressing um, regardless. So just put that out there. Um, 
to go down the list, our AWT um, MVP is Zachary Kumar. Class for Zach. <laughs> for CDS, we have Alexander Beltran. For EPO, we have Rebecca Wheeler. In Fuel Cell, we have Howard Lowe. In Portable Wind Power, we have Ne Patel. And for PWT, we have Steven Swee. So a round of applause to all of our MVPs as well as all of our members within the program. So moving forward to those of you guys who are not currently on Teams, we are recruiting. Um, the application is out. There's a QR code as well as the link to the application at the bottom of this slide. Applications are due this coming Wednesday, May 5th at 11.59 p.m. And interviews will be taking place next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. via Zoom. So I highly encourage that you apply to be a part of this team. It's a great hands-on experience. You get to meet a lot of different people within lots of different fields. Um, and if you would like to meet some of these members, there will be a poster session directly after this um, where you can move around the different breakout rooms and just meet all the different members and ask your questions. Okay. So one other thing before we move on to the poster session is we have a part two of Niche. So if you guys do not know, Niche is a Nano and Chemical Engineering Day, and it is a two-part event that includes a pitching competition with cash prizes, cash prizes, guys, um, as well as a career fair that is filled with recruiters as well as some grad school representatives that want to hire you and have you go to their grad school program. Um, currently, it is tentatively scheduled for some time in the middle of fall quarter, just so that it is um, competitively within the recruiting cycle. And beforehand, we will be also we will also be hosting um, career preparation events where you can do things like your resume or your elevator pitch and things like that. So make sure to look out for that within the upcoming fall quarter. So feel free to join us to find your niche. Okay, the thing you've all been waiting for, our poster session. So um, very soon I will be opening up breakout rooms that you will be able to um, move around in so you'll, you can manually select them. Um, it'll be on the bottom right corner of your Zoom control panel and it'll look like four squares in a grid. If you are a current project member, please enter your own room to begin with just so that we ensure that there are project members within the specific rooms, but you are encouraged to visit other rooms, talk to other members, and see what other teams are up to. If you are a prospective member, this is your chance to get to know the teams personally, talk to the members individually, and get any lingering questions answered. And before I open those, I just wanna say once again, thank you for joining us on this Saturday morning. Um, please remember to sign in. We'll try to link that back in the chat as well. And if I don't see you before we close the breakout rooms, once it, um, just so it's clear, the breakout rooms will be closing at 1230. If I don't see you before or after then, thank you for joining us. And I hope you guys all have a great day.